Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NQA webinar on CMMC. Uh, we still have people streaming in at a pretty regular pace here, so I'm going to uh, get started slowly and let people uh, get in and uh, hopefully not miss too much of the early introductions. Uh, before I get started too much, I know I've got some colleagues out there. If one of you can just confirm that you can hear me okay, I would appreciate that. Okay, so uh, let me give a introduction to myself. And uh, again, we've got people still coming in, so we can uh, let them do that. Um, speaking to you today, this is Tim Woodcomb uh, from NQA USA. Uh, I see a lot of familiar names in the attendee list, so I think I've met or spoken to uh, at least several of you in the past, and um, some names I certainly don't recognize. So. As an introduction, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and my role in history at NQA. I am uh, what we call uh, one of our business unit directors, uh, and CMMC falls under the business unit that uh, I'm responsible for. So as a business unit director, I've uh, kind of got the responsibility for everything uh, at some level for the given standards or services that fall under that. Uh, and by and large, what we're talking about today is the information security or cybersecurity uh, business sectors. So uh, it's certainly not me and only me. Uh, there's several people uh, within the organization and then, of course, a lot of auditors that, that help with that. Uh, but suffice to say, the buck kind of stops with me uh, in, in that regard. So uh, I've been with NQA for 20 plus years, uh, kind of started in a inside sales role, wound up doing a fair amount of operations, including uh, auditing, and that kind of aligns with the philosophy that we have at NQA today, where everyone really from the president on down uh, still does some audits. So I, I continue to be an auditor for certain standards, certain schemes. Uh, but then as a business unit role, again, kind of more involved in what's going on technically with either existing or new standards like this, getting involved where possible on writing committees and helping to, to shape those standards or shape how they're audited. Um, and then ultimately, you know, working with our growth or sales team to roll out new products and make sure that we can support our clients uh, suitably so. So. With that, uh, I'll start to go through the presentation, and uh, I am going to probably take questions towards the end. Hopefully, we'll have enough time to allow to address uh, as many as possible. So do feel free to type in questions as we go along here, um, but recognize that I'll probably address them at the end or after the fact. We are able to record all these and, and capture them and uh, get responses out after the fact as well. So. With that, just want to also uh, take quick mention of NQA. Again, I think most of the people on the line are familiar with NQA, but for those that may not be, um, we are a global ISO certification body, been around since 1988. Uh, a lot of you probably know us for our work in ISO 9000 or AS9100 or ISO 27001. Of course, ISO and AS are more in the quality realm. Uh, ISO 27001 gets us into the information or cybersecurity realm. And more so these days, as we uh, see more and more requirements, especially from the U.S. government, uh, we're getting into audits to the NIST 800-171 standard and or, of course, the, the CMMC standard, which we're talking about today. Uh, NQA uh, is a U.S.-owned and operated certification body. Uh, technically, I work for NQA USA. Um, there are also other international offices and auditors throughout the globe. So all told, we work with about 50,000 plus certification clients at this point. Um, 
again, getting a little bit back more to the US side, we have very, very strong DOD core competencies, particularly from the ISO uh, and AS side. AS, uh, as folks that may not know, is the aerospace quality standard, which largely is driven down by DOD suppliers and, and contractors. So a uh, lot of core competence. We're in a lot of those organizations in the DOD already. And for those that don't know, I'm guessing most do on the call, uh, CMMC is kind of vectored right to the DOD supply chain. So there's a good synergy there. And as you come to find, uh, NQA is an early and ongoing CMMC participant. And we're in the process now of becoming uh, an accredited certification body, or as they're calling it, a C3 PAO uh, in the applicant phase. So a quick overview of CMMC, and we'll kind of you know peel the onion further and further as we go through this. But starting at the high le level, uh, it is a U.S. Department of Defense mandate at this point. You know there are early signals that it will go beyond just uh, the Department of Defense in the U.S. and perhaps go beyond the U.S. as well. Uh, but suffice to say, for the moment, it is technically a U.S. DoD mandate. Uh, They've been talking about this for about a year and a half now in, in development and getting to the point where it's starting to going to be uh, written into RFPs. We're not quite there yet, uh, but that's going to be how they flow it down through, through RFP requirements. It is focused solely on cybersecurity processes and practices. And this presentation is not going to dive too deep into that. We certainly have plans to dive a little bit deeper in other venues. Um, but suffice to say that if you're not a cybersecurity person, um, this is probably the right webinar for you because it's going to start at the high levels and kind of get you to that point where you have enough information to bring it to your uh, IT or cyber personnel to, to give any guidance or support that they might need. Uh, as the name implies, the uh, cybersecurity maturity model certification is based on a maturity model comprised of five different levels. And we'll go through that uh, again at some level of detail throughout the presentation here. One of the key things is that um, it's a significant lift. Uh, estimates range from 300,000 to 350,000 contractors and some contractors throughout the defense industrial base that's going to be needing to achieve CMMC over the next five years or so. Uh, those organizations, a lot of you on the line, uh, will be known as OSCs or organizations seeking certification. Uh, for what it's worth, this uh, being a new program comes a lot comes along with a lot of new acronyms and i'll try to explain those uh, as i go along but uh, that's the first one you see osc those are basically uh, organizations looking for certification it is going to be a multi-year rollout and i think that's important to keep in mind this is not going to happen overnight it's going to happen basically through 2020 through 2025 so i know there's a lot of early interest and i'll, I'll say excitement on it uh, but bear in mind that not everyone on the call uh, will need to have CMMC certification, certainly not by this year, perhaps not even by 2021. Uh, it's going to be kind of hard to tell exactly when you're going to need it. So we'll talk about preparations. But I think the important takeaway is that it's not all going to happen overnight. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the whole program is managed centrally by the CMMC AB or the CMMC Accreditation Board. For those of you familiar with the ISO world and that model, um, accreditation bodies like ANAB or UCAS would be what you're typically familiar with uh, governing the certification bodies that do the audits for ISO standards. This is similar, uh, but it's different insofar as the CMMC AB is a completely unique body uh, has nothing to do with ANAB or UCAS or any of the other uh, ISO accreditation bodies. So that's part of what we're seeing. They're still forming. They're still getting some of their feet under themselves. Um, that's what we're seeing kind of happen as we speak. But suffice to say that everything from the training of auditors, uh, the content that that's being put on the website, the accreditation process for the CBs, even the vetting process for consultants, uh, all of that is going through the CMMC AB. So they're kind of keeping that central point of control. 
One of the things they have put up, uh, the CMMCAB, is a pretty decent website. And the website continues to evolve, and it evolves at a relatively rapid pace. So if, if you haven't looked at it in the past couple um, months or, or even weeks, I would say take another look at it because there is always new information up there. This is some of the early information they put up there, and it's still up there. You see the source down below, and I did confirm, as of yesterday at least, that it's still up there. And I think it's important to talk about these as kind of some of the high-level objectives of CMMC. So the first bullet talks about the fact that CMMC is really an amalgamation of existing cybersecurity standards and practices. So what you see within these requirements is not necessarily anything new but really a compilation of other existing controls and processes that were kind of brought together as, as best case practices. CMMC uh, itself and the certification and really the, the introduction to the third party um, audit firm builds upon the existing regulation uh, from the DFARS that talked about self-attestation uh, by organizations to NIST 800-171. The essential part of CMMC, though, again, is that third-party component to it, basically because what the DOD found was that self-attestation came in many different sizes and flavors. It really was highly dependent on the person doing the self-attestation or the organization doing the self-attestation. And, you know, not assuming anything nefarious per se, but just their understanding of what some of the requirements were or expectations were. Um, so in a way, uh, CMMC kind of closes the loophole on self-attestation. It also closes the loophole on POAMs. So we'll talk about that as well in terms of what that means in terms of findings. But in essence, it builds upon the existing DFAR process and will ultimately supersede it. One of their goals uh, that's stated, and I think it's important, is that it is meant to be cost effective and affordable especially for small businesses at the lower levels meaning the kind of tier one or maturity level one uh, i think is the intent there that's not to say that it's going to be you know simple or straightforward or, or you know short tiny audits for everybody so i think that comment does need to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt and i'll try to explain that as we go along and then last but not least kind of going to the the second bullet again um, the intent and really the, the hard and fast requirement that it is a third party process. Organizations cannot self attest to CMMC. Um, certification bodies need to be accredited by the CMMC AB to do CMMC audits. So uh, there's going to be a lot of controls in, in those respects. Okay, so just a, a few kind of straightforward transparent facts here. I want to try to boil this down because I know there's a lot of information out there and, and a lot of different sources. Knowing that NQA has been involved in this and participates in the, uh, the, the webinars and working groups and kind of has lines of communication with some of the, the AB uh, board members directly, I think this is pretty, pretty clear-cut information. It is changing though, so I'll try to point out, uh, particularly with the first thing, um, all along, it has been said that CMMC will start showing up in new RFPs or, or contracts in late 2020. That's still going to be the case, but they're backing down from that a little bit, I think because of some of the delays in part due to COVID and other situations. Um, they're backing down on how, how that's going to exactly happen or when that's going to exactly happen. Um, Initially, they were going to try to manage that, and I think they still are, but there may be the cases where other RFPs uh, invoke CMMC on kind of a voluntary basis, um, meaning they, they write it in without the CMMC requiring them to do so, and we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But suffice to say, we'll start seeing it in RFPs in 2020. In fact, we already have, and I'll allude to that in a moment as well. The RFPs themselves or the contract documents will specify which particular CMMC level is going to be needed for that contract. So it's not going to be a guessing game once you see the RFP. Uh, but at this point, we don't know exactly what's going to be what. As I mentioned, uh, the AB is looking to manage the ramp up through this year as they kind of launch the program. And that still is very much the case, again, particularly with regards to some of the building blocks on training, 
um, getting the, the C3PA hours accredited and again, getting it into uh, contracts. That's gonna be very much flowing through the CMMC AB this year. And then kind of uh, with the goal of getting an, a more open market in early 2021. CMMC will apply throughout the supply chain. So again, it's not just gonna be the prime contractor on that contract, it's gonna flow down to the subcontractors. And there is a little bit of grayness in terms of what exactly that means. Uh, I think from my perspective, certain contractors will need to have the same level of CMMC maturity as spelled out on the prime contractor level, uh, whereas others will be lesser. Um, so say, for example, a contract is spelled out at level three, certainly the prime would need to have level three. Some of the subs would need to have level three, but others of the subs might only need to have level one. And it really depends on the type of information that that contractor is privy to. And again, I'll, we'll talk about that momentarily, but that, that's really going to be the deciding factor. Mentioned already, so I won't belabor too much of this, but from our perspective, um, what you'll see as auditors coming in from someone like NQA is that those auditors need to be trained by what's being called a licensed training provider or another acronym, LTP. Um, so that training content, those training objectives, uh, the trainers themselves for that matter, are all gonna be vetted by the CMMC AB. They'll go through the training, but then actually go directly to the CMMC AB to take the test and get their ultimate qualifications. So uh, again, that's kind of where you're looking for from an accredited third party on this is that any of the assessors or auditors coming in will have gone through that rigor of qualification. Uh, the CMMC certification, of course, can only be attained through those third-party firms, C3PAOs. And uh, for those that are interested, what that stands for is a certified third-party assessing organization. Um, has nothing to do with Star Wars or anything like that, although that's what everyone immediately jumps to. Um, alluded to this, organizations must meet all requirements at the given level in order for the audit and IE certification to be successful. So there is going to be kind of the ISO concept of non-conformances that will be captured in the audit process and organizations will need to close out those non-conformances prior to getting a recommendation for certification. So if you're coming from the ISO angle, I think the closest analogy would be major non-conformances. So any findings uh, are gonna be treated kind of like a major non-conformance, they need to be closed out and reconfirmed by this assessing organization prior to a CMMC certification for that given level. So that might sound a little bit like bad news, but maybe the next item is good news. Uh, it's gonna be valid for three years, the certification, at least that's again, what the current information is. So once you've achieved that certification, first of all, it's good for any future RFPs that are at that certification or maturity model uh, level, assuming that your scope would cover uh, your bidding on other RFPs. So you don't want to be scoping too narrowly because once you achieve certification, that's valid for three years and valid for any other RFPs or contracts that might invoke the same CMMC level. And the other thing that's a bit of good news is that there's been talk all along that the cost of certification is going to be considered uh, what's called an allowable cost. And this is not my area of expertise, but again, those that are in this space probably know what an allowable cost means. Uh, in short, what it means that you can build some of that into your bid, uh, basically having the government offset or subsidize some of the certification costs. Um, but of course, how organizations go about that, that would be, be up to them. But that's certainly uh, something you'd wanna explore further and, and see how that works out for your organizations in particular. Okay, the timeline itself, uh, and this is, I've got kind of a planned iteration of this and some updates on what the actual is. So very simply kind of going back on the left side from 2019, up through again that five-year implementation period up through 2025 with the red hashed line kind of about in the center more or less where we're at um, the goal was to have the auditor training roll out in about june 2020 
with the certification bodies being accredited about now, July, August, 2020. And um, some of the RFP is starting to come out in Q3, Q4, let's call it late 2020 with uh, the initial round of certifications in early 2021. That's shifted a little bit. And again, there's been a couple more interim steps or maybe just a little more detail added to it. So the most significant thing you might notice there is that the auditor training has been a little bit delayed. Uh, they are working on finalizing that. They've done some initial uh, pilots of it. And word on the street is that the, the auditors who've already submitted applications, they're gonna be down selected within the next week or two uh, with the training to most likely be targeted for more of an August, September timeframe. So about a month slip there, not a big deal. Similarly, on the C3PAO side, um, the application did come out in July and, and NQA was one of the applicants and is one of the applicants for that. Uh, but finalizing that entire accreditation process, that has not yet been done. And again, word on the street that we're getting is that that's again looking at the August, September timeframe. So, so it makes sense that those two kind of are coupled together, uh, the auditor training and the C3PO accreditation, because obviously the, the auditing firms need auditors and the auditors will be working under the firms. So those two kind of going together makes sense and still coming up within the, 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 the near future. As to uh, the contracts and the uh, the rollout early 2021 and the five-year rollout through 2025, that remains really unchanged, you know, from, from the macro level. Yes, maybe there's going to be some minor tweaks in terms of what happens late this year, but big picture-wise, it's still very, very much on track. With that, though, and again, uh, you know, kind of trying to add value here in terms of what we know uh, from the work we've been doing to keep up with this. There are a couple of very, very recent developments that I just wanted to mention as well. One is that, uh, again, most folks would probably know, uh, mentioned the DFARS already. DFARS currently reference the NIST 800-171 um, self-attestation. So nowhere in the DFARS does it reference CMMC at this point. So obviously a rules change is needed to be done for that. We have information that that is in the works. It's currently with the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. Um, so that, you know, the, the, the COGS are in motion to make that happen. They recognize that that does need to happen. And I suspect we'll probably see that within the coming months. The other thing that was very interesting, kind of caught some people uh, by surprise, was the recent release of uh, an RFP called GSA STARS-3. It was the first RFP out there to reference CMMC, uh, which obviously is significant. What's perhaps equally significant and hearkening back to some of my early comments is that it is not a DOD contract or RFP. Uh, it's a GSA uh, RFP, which is government you know, wide. So the GSA STARS-3 contract or RFP is, is for a huge $50 billion uh, government wide IT service contract. Um, so obviously it's kind of up the alley of cybersecurity. So that's probably more why they referenced it because they were very much in tune with it, even though they're not coming from the DOD side. And in essence, what it says is that the GSA reserves the right to survey any STARS-3 awardees for CMMC or ISO certifications. Uh, and again, for the folks that uh, are in the government space already, you probably know that whether it's ISO 9001 or ISO 20,000 or ISO 27,000, or we've even seen now ISO 28,000. Uh, a lot of these RFPs, a lot of these scoring models uh, get or rely on ISO certifications. So that's not going away. And what the GSA is basically saying is that they're going to be reserving the right to, which means they effectively will, uh, be going back to their awardees and checking up on any ISO certifications and or CMC certifications down the line. All right, so switching gears a little bit then in terms of kind of the current status and the timeline, I want to talk about the standard itself. Um, and again, knowing that a lot of the audience is kind of coming from the ISO angle, I've tried to draw similarities or differences where possible to the ISO management system. And the first thing to note is that it's not a management system. Uh, CMMC is based strictly on what they call practices. 
um, which if you are familiar with ISO 27001 would be synonymous with their controls in Annex A. Um, but for the ISO folks, the, the ISO 9001 or AS folks, the reality is, you know, that their requirements, call them practices, call them controls, it's, what gonna, it's what's going to be audited. So practices, controls, requirements at some level are all synonymous, but it does not have the, the management system makings uh, in terms of what you're familiar with from an ISO model. However, um, many of the ISO processes, I think, are very applicable. Some of the controls, or, or sorry, some of the practices talk about having documents or having policies or doing training. Uh, there's audit and assessment, there's risk. So again, from the ISO angle, those are all familiar topics to many of us. And I think that, number one, uh, serves as a good jumping off point if your ISO system, if you have an ISO system, it certainly serves as a good jumping off point for CMMC. And if you're coming at this from the, let's say, non-IT angle, so whether it's quality or, or otherwise, there's going to be some of these controls that are not pure IT, they're kind of agnostic. And I think that there's, again, a, a role and a place for existing I'll say quality managers to help an organization achieve CMMC based on leveraging your existing ISO processes such as these. Mentioned before that really the main objective and, and kind of uh, driving which level is all about the information that the organization has. And it's really broken down to two significant things, that being federal contract information, which is kind of less um, less critical, if you will, less confidential. Uh, that would kind of allude to a level one CMMC certification if you only have federal contract or FCI information, as opposed to the uh, controlled unclassified information, which is uh, more tr in terms of what the NIST 800-171 and the DFARS is, is invoking. So if you have CUI today, that would map you more to a level three CMMC certification. Um, similar to ISO, organizations can scope either the entire organization or parts thereof. I think, as I said before, the warning would be if you scope too narrowly, know that that certification may or may not work for future RFPs. So you know, while it might be enticing to start small, recognize that um, that certification might be of limited use for future RFPs if you do so. Just be aware of that. I think the most important thing on this slide, if you take anything away from this slide, is the last set of bullets. Um, the quote unquote standard, as I've kind of got there, is really made up of two documents. Uh, the primary documents is the, the first one, the, the, what they call the model. Uh, technically, at today, it's at version 1.02. So the model would be synonymous again with something like an ISO 9001 uh, where the requirements are stated i.e. in this case the practices or controls are stated so the model is certainly something you want to get your hands on and there's links in the presentation to where you would get that if you don't already but I think more importantly when a lot of people have skipped over is the the compendium document there the CMMC model appendices it's a very big document and it looks a little daunting if you open it up and see it's several hundred pages long uh, as opposed to under 100 pages for the model. Um, but what it does is it effectively acts as the insight and almost the answers to the test to all of the controls, all the practices within the model. Uh, so again, if you're coming from the ISO angle, think of it as ISO 9004. Uh, in relationship to ISO 9001. And I'll show you some uh, you know, one quick example of it, but it basically takes every one of those controls or practices or requirements, um, restates it, of course, but then offers some CMC uh, interpretive guidance, and then more often than not, even some kind of real case or, or real life examples of what you should be looking for, to do. So I would say, if nothing else, spend time looking at the appendices because that gives you a lot of a lot of the, the meat to chew on. In terms of um, the CMMC standard and kind of the, the lineage to it, um, 
I'm not going to spend too much time here, not terribly important, but I think the critical thing is that the DFARs that, again, I've harped on and the, the NIST 800-171 that organizations might be familiar with, that largely maps to a CMMC level three status. Uh, there are a couple of other controls, about 20 other controls beyond the 110 uh, coming out of NIST 800-171, but suffice to say that if you need to be compliant with NIST 800-171 today, you'll most likely need to be CMMC certified level three uh, in the future. And uh, assuming that you've done your due diligence and are meeting the controls in 800-171, you're well on your way to meeting CMMC level three. In terms of breaking it down, um, mentioned level one being probably where that uh, initial bullet of the government wanting to be cost effective on. There's only 17 controls there. Um, it, it basically boils down to, to basic cyber hygiene as they're talking about it. But you can see as you go up the scale, uh, more and more controls or practices get added I want to pause at level three because I think the, the two critical levels are going to be level one and level three. Most organizations are going to fall into one of those two categories. Level three, as I mentioned, uh, 130 controls, most of which are based on 800-171. So that's kind of where you want to be looking at. And then as you continue to go up to level four and level five, uh, additional controls added on. But the thinking is that um, levels four and level five are going to be relatively limited probably thinking more along the lines of prime contractors, not subcontractors. All that may be subject to change, but again, I think level three is kind of where you want to have your focus. Just in another way they slice this, and again, this comes straight from the CMMC information, so feel free to, to get on those websites and take a look at, but that kind of just gives a little more uh, history of the, the lineage and a little bit of the progression. Another way they look at this is in terms of process maturity. So it's not going to be just about the controls and, and checking the box, so to speak, but we are going to be looking for process maturities. Uh, and the, the simplest way they define it is you're working up from the bottom. Uh, uh, maturity level one simply indicates that the processes are being performed. So think kind of ad hoc, you know, someone's doing it, so someone made it happen. Um, maybe there's not a document, maybe there's not a management process to it, but it's 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 happening for better or worse. At level two, gets a little bit more mature, it's documented. At level three, it's documented and managed, and of course all these are progressive, so performed, documented, managed, um, reviewed. I would almost say a level four is kind of on par with what we would expect from an ISO 27001 organization. So for any of the 27001 organizations out there, you, know, you might argue that you're at a level four in terms of process maturity. Um, that's a little bit different than the controls that are included, but certainly ISO would expect kind of the plan to check act to be similar to the performed uh, documented managed reviewed. And then level five being the highest, being optimized, kind of dealing with advanced persistent threats or being proactive. Again, going to be reserved probably for the, 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 the upper, upper echelon of organizations that need that. Um, more or less what I just discussed previously, so apologize for the redundancy. I won't go through that. Okay, so as far as, again, how the, the standard, the quote-unquote standard is divided, um, again, take everything that you knew about ISO and kind of throw it out the window. The sections, if you will, are being called domains. And again, for 27,001 folks, think in terms of Annex A more so, and you'll see a lot of the, the similarities here. Uh, but for those that aren't familiar with that, these are the 17 domains, and this is where those practices or controls will each fall under one of these 17 domains. Various domains have uh, more or less practices, and each domain, uh, again, may or may not have practices at the different levels, maturity levels. So not uh, every one of these domains, for example, um, will have the same number of, of practices at the various levels. But what you see in the domains is that, yes, a lot of these are kind of IT-centric access control, uh, talks about 
how people access the IT system or computers or network. Uh, asset management, talking about the IT assets, the hardware, software, for that matter. Uh, but then you get to something like audit and accountability. And that's, again, hearkening back to what I mentioned, that some of these practices are not IT-centric per se, and this might have opportunities for ISO folks to get in and help with. So whether it's audit and accountability or awareness and training, uh, jump down to risk management, some of those things uh, might not be quite as, as straight up the fairway IT. Uh, there may be more uh, process controls that, that could be focused on. But configuration management, ID, authentication, incident response, maintenance, yes, those are all IT, as you see most of them probably are kind of centered on IT. But I think the takeaway, again, for me is that the best case scenario is that CMMC not be dumped, certainly not be dumped uh, on the ISO team to take full shouldering of implementing. But also, it probably shouldn't be dumped solely on the IT group's uh, shoulders for, for implementing. The best case scenario is taking the best of both worlds, uh, the ISO folks that are familiar with third-party audits, that are familiar with documenting procedures and training and, and coming up with policies and auditing, uh, having those folks work in collaboration with the IT folks that are already going to be familiar with a lot of these domains and have a lot of controls in those domains. If those two groups can come together, I think that's the recipe for success. So just go, again, knowing that the audience and the, and the objective of this website is not to get too, too deep into the standards, I just want to give you one quick example of um, the model and the appendices. So again, think the 9001 and 9004 comparisons. So this is the, the very first control for that matter, access control. Um, you see these are all under level one. So those first uh, four controls would be the access control requirements for a level one organization. And real quickly, you can kind of see the numerology there, AC related, relating back to the domain, meaning access control, one, uh, being level one and then 001 being the sequential number of the control. If you scan down, you can kind of see under level two, about halfway down the page, the numbering system changes to AC. You're still in access control, but now dot two. And again, the, the 005 through 007 just being sequential. So that's how the numbering works. But if we go back up to AC.1.001, the requirement or the practice or the control is very simply stated as limit information system access to authorized users, processes, acting on behalf of authorized users or devices, including other information systems. So that may sound a little bit Greek to anyone outside the IT world. Guarantee that an IT person knows exactly what that means. But if you take that same requirement in the CMMC appendices, so there it is, restated AC1 or AC.1.001. If you look further down, that's really, really where the, the gold of this appendix comes in. The first bit is it gives a little more discussion uh, from the source. So whether that's NIST or otherwise, it, this is really, again, kind of getting into the heads of um, CMMC and what they're thinking, what they're expecting. And then even more so, at the very bottom, the CMMC clarification and the two examples you see, I think even for the non-IT folks, if you look at example one, that pretty much puts it in, in the most basic sense. So everyone now understands that, okay, access control and what that requirement was, was very simply, you need a username and password to get on the computer. And I think most organizations have that today. No one can use a company computer without a username and password. And you give those usernames and passwords only to employees who have permission to be on the system. And when that person leaves, you disable that. Pretty basic stuff. Gets back to, again, this is level one. This is basic cyber hygiene. If an organization out there today that's working on DOD contracts doesn't have this, I think it's hard to argue that they don't need it. So if there's an organization out there, period, that doesn't have this, I think it's hard to argue that they don't need it. So 
that gives you a sense, uh, I guess, first of all, for the level of practices expected at level one, uh, which are pretty much expected. Um, and also, again, to illustrate the, the value of using that appendix document in addition to the CMMC model. Okay, so just recapping and again, really just highlighting, get the appendix. I'll show you where that is uh, at the end of the web website here, web webinar. Uh, and then takeaways in general, I do think a lot of the practices are going to already be in place within your organization. You may need to get with IT to figure that out. You will need to get with IT to figure that out. Um, CMMC on their website advises about a six-month preparation period. I would say the NQA caveat to that is it highly depends on where your starting point is and what maturity level you're going for. With 17 controls at level one, that's probably going to be a different preparation period than 130 controls at level three. And again, depending where you're starting from, that's your baseline. So take that six month preparation period with a grain of salt, but suffice to say, it's not gonna be an overnight thing. Um, mentioned already that the support and collaboration between ISO and QMS could be key. Uh, as you'd expect, the requirements do get more complex as the level or maturity level increases. So not all the controls or practices are gonna be quite as simple as having a username and password. I think that's to be understood. And then lastly, as I've said before, if you're already aligned and needing to be aligned to 800 per the DFARS, 242, 204, 7012, uh, target CMMC level three. In terms of uh, the likely distribution of those levels, so I'll talk briefly about that. It's been very clear from the outset, CMMC uh, and the DOD for that matter, is saying that the largest group and the smallest organizations are most likely going to fall into level one. Bear in mind, though, that this encompasses everyone throughout the DOD supply chain. So again, you know, right from the primes that are getting you know the most confidential, top secret information, down to you know service providers that have nothing to do necessarily with what's being built or what's being um, developed, but service organizations that are just supporting DOD from kind of uh, areas unrelated to uh, you know, the, the, the given product. So I think for most of the folks on the line uh, that are either ISO or AS, because you're in the DOD or supply chain or in the, in the defense industrial base, I do think level three is where your focus is gonna be. Beyond that, as, as, as I've said, uh, kind of coming again from CMCAB, level four and level five, they're throwing out less than 1%. That might be a little bit conservative, but suffice to say, the large, large majority is going to be in level one and level three. In terms of the, the whole CMMC ecosystem, have already kind of alluded to CMMC AB kind of controlling all these components, be it the licensed training providers to the certification of, and training of the assessors, to the accreditation to the C3PAOs like NQA, uh, who ultimately will work for um, organizations like yourself, there is going to be kind of that outside of the the required circle, if you will, other organizations, uh, registered practitioners and registered provider organizations kind of being uh, what we might term consultants in our world. There is going to be vetting of those individuals. I think the, the buyer beware caveat is that that's not necessarily going to be required, though. So if you choose to engage with a quote unquote consultant or an RPO, uh, do make sure, or at least my opinion would be, do make sure or do be aware uh, that there is this qualification called a registered provider organization or for the individual consultant person themselves, uh, a registered practitioner qualification that would have those individuals and organizations get some vetting from the CMMC AB, uh, be aware of that as opposed to someone that doesn't have those qualifications just kind of coming in off the street because I think with those, you, you need to be aware that you may or may not be getting um, all the information or all the accurate information that hopefully an RP or an RPO would have. So getting back to NQA uh, in terms of our status, 
again, will be known as what's going to be called a C3 PAO or a certification body, as I'm sure a lot of people will still reference it as. Um, as shown in the timeline before, we've been involved with the CMMCAB since about this time last summer, uh, back when there were face-to-face -face meetings happening. Uh, one of my colleagues, Lynette Rowe, uh, who's down in the DC area, was attending some of those early meetings where, you know, this was pre the AB even being formed. So kind of working groups and industry groups. Uh, we've been involved since that and continue to have active engagement with a lot of those folks uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, as I mentioned, we are still uh, what would be considered a pending C3PO, so we are not fully accredited. No one is fully accredited. Uh, we've gone as far as the process will take us. We've gone as far as anyone can go. So if anyone's out there saying that they're an accredited C3PAO, that's just simply not true uh, because that hasn't happened yet. Um, similarly, on the assessor side, we have uh, over a dozen assessors that have put in their applications and again, kind of following the same path and same uh, status, the assessors uh, were allowed to put in applications and that as far as that process has gone thus yet, thus far. Uh, word on the street again is that those initial auditors are going to be selected for the training within the next couple of weeks and we hope to have uh, assessors take those next steps. But at this point, we've got about a dozen people, over a dozen people, uh, in the process as far as they can go. And we'll continue to push that both those envelopes so that we make sure that NQA is on the, the leading edge of uh, becoming CMMC ready for organizations. So at this point, we can deliver some services, and we'll talk about that. But uh, that's where the official accreditation process uh, stands. In terms of what the audits will look like, uh, we don't know all of this yet. So a lot of this is a bit of a guess or a bit of a summation. Um, we, we are knowing that the audit durations will vary by level. And again, if you're at a level one in a very small organization, I think you can think of your audit in terms of days or you know, maybe even a day, who knows? Um, as opposed to if you're in that upper echelon, you know, if you're at level three or beyond, um, I think you're talking multiple days to perhaps even, you know, what you would consider weeks. But again, you know, if we can throw multiple audit tours at it. Uh, you know, again, it would be like an ISO audit. If your ISO audit is is 10 audit days, it doesn't necessarily have to span into two weeks. It could potentially be done with multiple auditors within a week's time. But think of it in terms of audit days. It might bridge over uh, multiple, multiple days. Uh, talked about the accreditation third party. It needs to go through that. The audits are going to be similar to ISO audits, so maybe more in depth, maybe a little bit more technically oriented, uh, just due to the nature of the quote unquote requirements or practices or controls. Uh, but they are intended to be on site. There is talk that the first few again may get some waivers for for off site or remote audits, but they're intended to be very much in depth, objective, evidence based audits, similar to what you've experienced from NQA in the past. Uh, there is no requirement for a stage one audit. And as I said before, there's no requirement for a surveillance audit in those intervening years. So there are um, pre-assessments or gap assessments that organizations like NQA can offer, uh, but not required in terms of a stage one or intervening year audit. Mentioned uh, findings, and, and this is where the, I guess the most granularity that we have comes up at the moment. So any findings to the various controls that are identified will be written up and the organization has 90 days to resolve those. And by resolve, we basically mean implement, get the auditor to revisit and confirm and, and validate that they've been implemented and clear them in essence. So again, if you're coming from the ISO angle, think in terms of how a major nonconformance is treated. So the concept of POAMs or plans of action and milestones, that goes away. You cannot have any open POAMs and meet the given CMMC level. So it'll be handled more like traditional ISO nonconformances. And then to meet the given CMMC level, all those practices need to be met, again, inclusive of any findings and closing them out within 90 days. One uniqueness, and, and you know, this is more anecdotal, I guess, is that the CMMC, AB again, uh, our reports are gonna be submitted to them. 
they're going to review and they're going to issue the certification. So anyone that's familiar with CMMI, uh, they're kind of taking that model uh, or that tack, whereby the um, AB will be doing some of that back office activity. Okay, um, kind of coming down the end here and just uh, keep it a little bit light. Famous quote that a lot of po folks probably know, uh, Donald Rumsfeld said this years ago, and I think it's apropos here because as the Defense Secretary, we're talking DOD initiatives here under CMMC, and it goes like, because as we know, there are known knowns, there are things we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we know, we don't know. So how does that relate to CMMC? Well, there are still a lot of known unknowns. There's probably some unknown unknowns as well, but I'll tell you about those when I find out about them. But for the known unknowns, we obviously don't know exactly which contracts CMMC is gonna be referenced in first or when those are gonna start coming down. Um, and thinking in it, of it kind of from your perspective, you know, it's kind of a matter of, okay, when when is my number called? When is my straw picked? I can't tell you that. Uh, so we're going to need to kind of stay tuned with um, what you, we see coming down. We also don't know exactly how the various levels and flow down is going to work. I think we have some pretty good guesses on that. Again, highly tied to the level of information you're getting, whether it's CUI or FCI. Uh, and I think, again, most of the folks on the call can kind of put a fair amount of money on expecting level three. But we don't know that for sure. We also don't exactly know what, if any, uh, organizational qualifications, i.e. training, might be required. And I'll show you what's kind of leading me to that comment in, in a moment here. We don't know the audit durations, as I've already alluded to, exactly. We kind of, again, have a rough order of magnitude in mind. We don't know what the costs are going to be. And we don't exactly know what that allowable cost concept is going to be. For those that are familiar with allowable cost, again, you probably have a better idea but it's going to be kind of a question of how do you build that into the contract and how does that make you more or less competitive if you do so and, and so on and so forth. So some questions around that. We don't exactly know when the audits may begin. Uh, the short answer is they, they cannot happen now. We cannot be doing official CMMC audits. We can be doing CMMC gap assessments and we are doing those. But as far as the official CMMC certification audits, we don't know exactly when they're going to begin. Um, most likely late this year, perhaps early 2021. But again, that's kind of order of magnitude or a rough estimate that we're dialing in as we go along. And the interesting topic here, the last one, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we've heard a lot of talk about this, reciprocity for ISO 27001. So in short, what that is inferring is that if an organization has an existing accredited ISO 27001 certification, what does that mean for their CMMC? Do they get some some amount of reciprocity for that, meaning their CMMC audit might be able to take credit for the existing ISO 27001 work? And if so, does that mean the CMMC audit is shortened? Does it mean that certain areas aren't covered? I don't think it means that the CMMC audit goes away completely. Uh, I think it's gonna be kind of a, a prorated type reciprocity. But we don't know anything about that other than that it's been mentioned and it continues to be mentioned. Um, and that brings some interesting thoughts because CMMC, of course, right now vectored purely to DOD, maybe future state, you know, larger US government. But that still leaves the private sector. And the private sector, of course, may or may not care about CMMC. They may or may not know about CMMC. But more than likely than not, they know about ISO and they might might know about ISO 27001. Certainly, if you've got customers outside of the US, particularly you know, Europe and Asia, 27001 is a, is a big deal. So there may be a very solid value proposition to starting off or, or planning to uh, incorporate 27001 and the CMMC controls, both 
to address all of your customer base and to get this potential reciprocity for CMMC, but we don't exactly know what that looks like. Mentioned real quickly uh, that this is something that uh, it's kind of like an Easter egg hunt going through the, the, the updates to the CMMC website. So this was something that came out in one of the more recent releases. Again, uh, confirmed that it was there yesterday. What I'm looking at is the uh, the, the middle bit, the multicolored bit. Straight from the, the website, uh, talking about one of the levels, the basic level, if you will, the base level for CMMC assessors called the Certified Professional. Skip over the applications available now. It says, an entry-level certification used as a prerequisite for becoming a, CM, a certified CMMC AB assessor, meaning an NQA assessor, or an instructor, which would allude to a training provider. So that's that's us. That's not what you guys need to worry about. But then the last bit, and I added the emphasis, additionally required as an in-house employee assisting the organization with the build-out of CMME, CMMC maturity level capability. That hit me like a ton of bricks, and it might be doing the same for you. Again, don't know what that means. There hasn't been a lot of expounding on that, but it seems to imply that they're also looking for organizations to have that traceability, if you will, uh, to some official CMMC training with any organization getting certified. So that certainly could be, as stated there, an in-house employee, meaning you need to send someone to this CMMC uh, CP level training. It's unclear if hiring one of those consultants, a registered practitioner or a registered um, uh, provider organization will suffice. So that's why it falls under, under the known unknowns. But be aware of this. Um, the good news is these trainings are relatively economical. Probably not a bad idea to have people go through anyways. Uh, they're gonna be online, at least initially. So yeah, th there's, a, there's a solid argument for having uh, an in-house employee go through this training regardless, uh, but it may well be a requirement. Okay, so uh, coming down the final stretch here, CMMC knowns, what do we know? Well, we know that, again, the development continues relatively unabated, unslowed at this time. So, you know, if you've heard um, anecdotally about things not happening or time frames shifting or this falling apart, or going away, that's not happening. Uh, it's continuing, again, on the big scale as planned. Whether or not those exact 10 RFPs are issued late this year invoking CMMC. Again, maybe that's a question. You know, maybe it's not going to be 10. Maybe it's frankly going to be more. We've already seen one uh, that GSA stars kind of jumped the gun. So it might be 10. It might be seven. It might be 27. I don't know, but it's going to start happening. It's already started happening. And then you can think about how those contracts proliferate down through the supply chain. So even though that sounds like small numbers, 10 RFPs, that extrapolates to roughly 1,500 suppliers. So that means 1,500 CMC certifications needed late this year or early 2021. And that's where you start to see the numbers really start to take hold, getting us to that 300,000 or 350,000 uh, over the next five, five to six years. So. Those things we do know. We also know that primes uh, have been really since the beginning of the year uh, flowing this down or flowing down their CMMC expectations to the supply chain. You know they're they're much in tune to this as well. You know a lot of the same folks uh, are on the the working groups or in the committees that we see, and they recognize that their success is going to be tied to their supply chain success. So their ability to bid or uh, receive a contract that invokes CMMC is gonna be tied at the hip to the suppliers or subs that they have on that contract. So they, they've been pushing uh, early and I would say often to make sure that this, their supply chain is, is aware of this and starting to get ready. Most of those suppliers again will fall in either level one or level three. The re reason I keep skipping over level two, uh, that may be a question is 
that's kind of what CMC has said, is that level two is kind of a, a milestone or a waypoint between level one and level three, but not many, if any, contracts are gonna spell out level two. It's gonna be kind of level one or level three or above that. Regardless though, as we've said before, both levels, all levels require that third party CMMC audit and certification. Real quickly here, this is just an example of what we've seen to kind of support, and I, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have, have gotten these memos or letters, but this is from a, a prime, a communication sent down there to their supplier. So as a XYZ supplier who supports DOD contracts, it's critical that you become familiar with the DOD's evolving cybersecurity, referred to as CMC, so on and so forth. So if you've got one of these, this maybe gives a little more context about what's being expected. If you don't think you've gotten one of these, you might ask around because again, these have become pretty prolific. Um, it may be sitting on someone's desk. It may be sitting with someone that doesn't really understand what the ramifications are. But again, pretty good money that if you're in the DOD supply chain, someone in your organization has gotten one of these memos or letters from one of the primes at some point in time. A couple other knowns, uh, we know what the requirements are. You know, Again, we've got the standard or, or the model, uh, and more so than that, we know what it's based on. It's based on 8171, NIST 8171, which has been around for several years, and NQA has been conducting assessments to for several years. So the requirements aren't terribly new or different. Um, again, they come from all pre-existing standards, so there's a lot of work we can do to understand the requirements and and get organizations ready to them. As I said before, many OSCs or organizations seeking certification are incorporating those additional CMMC controls into their 27001 management system. And for those that are interested in doing so, we can certainly talk uh, more concretely about how to do that. But just suffice to say that it's additional controls. Annex A is not the be all end all. Uh, it says that within 27001, you're more than welcome, encouraged, frankly, to add additional controls to be audited under 27001 on top of Annex A. And that's what you'd do here. <clears throat> All right, and proactive organizations are getting ready now. So how would you do that potentially? Quick, just kind of high level action plan to consider. I think the first thing you'd want to do as an organization is determine or try to determine what maturity level you need to target. You do that by talking to your clients, looking for any of those communications that you may have gotten, determine whether or not you're already needing to be compliant with the DFARS and the state in 171. If so, again, that points to level three. And then once you've done that, kind of estimate or again, talk with your clients about what their timeline is because you don't want to be caught off guard by your supplier or your customer rather saying, okay, we are looking at this RFP for level three, we need all our suppliers to be ready for this so we can bid within the next couple of weeks, couple of months. You want to have months to be ready for that when that comes. Um, so review the applicable maturity level requirements. So if you're going to shoot for level three, start understanding what's included in level three, uh, both in terms of requirements and, and the practices and controls, and then ultimately take stock of where you're at do a gap assessment, whether you do that yourself, whether you have someone else do that, figure out where you're at, which then gets you into the implementation phase. Most likely, you'll have some of those practices in place, but some of them might need to be enhanced or tweaked or you know, made to better align with how it's stated in CMMC. You know, take the access control one as an example. Guarantee that most, if not all organizations have, have access control, but has it addressed all the aspects or angles of it uh, as shown in the CMMC interpretations. Uh, there may well be other practices that are not in place that would need to be implemented. So obviously you want to kind of do your gap assessment, figure out what you've got uh, that needs relatively simple enhancement versus what you've got or don't have, I guess you should say, uh, that needs full up implementation. It will need documentation. Again, particularly if you're shooting for level three, um, you will need documents and policies, so you can certainly start writing those. Again, you know what the requirements are. You know that for level three, they're going to need to be um, 
implemented and documented and, and, and managed so you can start to create, if nothing else, frameworks for those documents. You know that there's gonna be some training and rollout needed. So again, you can get started at some level, even if it's just uh, informational or kind of awareness training such as this, you can certainly start to do that. And then I would encourage you to engage with a potential certification firm or C3PO like NQA as soon as you're ready to start thinking about that. One of the concerns we have is resource constraints. So we know that there's gonna be an early kind of big wave of this. That's why we're getting as many auditors ramped up for this as possible. Um, but there's gonna be resource constraints. So the earlier you can get on the radar, the earlier you can get on the schedule, frankly, uh, the better. So don't wait to the last minute. Don't wait until um, your customer is needling you for your certification within a matter of weeks or even with a matter of, of months. You wanna have a good runway to get prepared, get on the schedule and get this done right. Um, resources, and this slide deck uh, will be provided to everyone uh, tomorrow. Uh, so that will be sent out to folks. So um, just wanna mention that here, but uh, this gives you links to both the quote unquote standard being that model uh, and the guidance document being those appendices right there. Um, one of the recent additions to the CMMC webpage or, or, or a website, I guess you should say, is a web page vectored towards the organizations seeking certification or the OSCs. Uh, and that third link gives you a link right to that, the CMMC OSC uh, web, web page. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, NQA information on CMMC, uh, which similarly, although probably not as quite as quick a clip as uh, CMMC, uh, continues to evolve and we continue to post information about CMMC and developments and tools and resources on the NQA website for CMMC as well. Okay, and uh, second to last, uh, just a little bit of contact information from me. Uh, again, as the business unit director, I've kind of got more of the strategic angle to this. If you are ready to talk about quotes or getting, uh, you know, in the NQA fold for this, uh, or frankly for any other ISO standards, your kind of more tactical points of contact are, are two folks. Terry Senna covers the, the Western portion of US for uh, initial client support or, or regional sales. And AJ covers the Eastern portion uh, and their contact emails are available there. You can also go again right straight to the NQA website and uh, you know just put contact uh, us information in there or um, uh, quick quote type information. Okay, so with that, I apologize. I managed to go uh, about 10 minutes over. Um, I'm not going to spend too, too much time if there are any questions, but again, do feel free to uh, record them and uh, we'll, we'll take them certainly after the fact. I'm just going to quickly scroll through here and um, take a quick look to see if there's anything uh, kind of major that I might have missed. There is a question about mapping, uh, and, and yes, that, that is actually on our project plan. Uh, we're not quite ready to release that, but we are looking for mapping to address uh, kind of a cross-reference or a crosswalk, if you will, between CMMC, uh, NIST, because that's the kind of underlying document, and um, something like 27,001. So that certainly would be a great tool and, and will be something we'll be working on. A um, couple comments about similarity between domains and 27,001, and I agree. Some of the domains are, are you know, word for word, the same asset management, access control. Others are a little bit less obvious, but a lot of, lot of overlap, suffice to say, and that's where the, where the contract issue is there. Question about COVID and remote audits. Yes, uh, at the moment they are talking about more than likely being remote audits, at least initially. Can't tell you how long that would last. So I guess that falls into the category of, of known unknowns. I don't know how long remote audits will be allowed. Uh, will and could be having other webinars? Yes, in fact, one of the ideas is to start to drill down deeper into those domains, into the, some of the te technical aspects of it. 
uh, and obviously give updates as we find them as this continues to evolve. So, so stay tuned for that. Uh, if a company reaches level one, should it hold off for level three, thereby avoiding level two audits? Again, I'm not even sure a level two audit would be a thing. I guess you could do a gap assessment to level two, um, but I'm not sure that level two certification would be a thing. So I think the short answer is officially yes, although you might want to do a gap. You know, it, it's kind of, you know, how do you choose to eat the elephant? Uh, level two is a nice stopping point, so you might do a gap assessment there, but yeah, you might not do full up certification. Um, do you have to have a program for CMMC or can you bring it into 9001? 9001 would be a little bit tough, frankly. Um, not a bad idea to use the same kind of management system methodology in terms of management review, internal audits, corrective action processes. But really, the better um, role in would be 27001 because 27001 has all those management system building blocks plus a set of controls which will in part overlap to CMMC and whatever part doesn't overlap, you would add the controls to that. So really 27,001 is a better uh, ISO model to bring in. But uh, I think there is value to you know kind of running it under some of the 9,001 methodologies, but it just doesn't fit quite as well. Uh, is there an email to sign up? I'm going to have to defer that to the marketing team. I think uh, I think by virtue of you being on this webinar, you'll get updates, but we can look into that. And I think that kind of covers uh, some of the big picture questions. So with that, I'm going to sign off uh, now that we've gone uh, even further over the, the allocated hour. I do appreciate everyone that uh, joined today and hope to see you on future webinars or hope to have discussions uh, with you either directly or via our sales team and hope that we can do everything to uh, help you out in terms of understanding and achieving a successful CMMC certification when you're ready for that. So thanks, folks, and uh, have a good afternoon.